Thank you all for joining us. So I'll start with a question to Professor Dulio. Uh, is there an area you, um, concerning Secretary of State that you feel different players in the electoral process fully don't understand? And by players, I, it could be anyone, like voters, academics, politicians, uh, anyone. Sure, and thanks for having me, Todd. I, you know, I think that that's a, a great question uh, for us to think about nationally, but uh, also for folks within all the 50 states and DC, right? I mean, it, it, because all the uh, electoral administration is different in all 50 states with, with our federalist system, right? And, and I'll give you an example here in Michigan uh, that might be of interest to folks across the country, right? The, while the, the Secretary of State here is the chief elections officer, the actual administration of elections across Michigan is done by about 1,500 local clerks. So there are, it's not just the Secretary of State that's involved, right? So uh, I think that might be uh, something for, for folks watching to go explore what's, uh, what's really the, where's the power really lie in their own state? Oh, that's an excellent point. Uh, Mark, do you have something to add to that? I agree totally with David. The reality is that, that secretaries of state, you know, of which only about 24, 25 directly involved in elections that are elected. There are a lot of, every state has a slightly different system. So we've got state boards of elections and things like that. But the truth of the matter is in almost every state where the rubber hits the road is at the county level, county boards of elections, yet it varies. If you're in Louisiana, they're parishes, they don't have counties and things like that. It varies from state to state, but our system is very much a locally driven system. And how people vote and cast votes in one municipality can be slightly different and how to count them slightly different in different municipalities. So you really, you know, the, the the political players in the process at the local level, the county chairmen and the state chairmen understand that. I'm not sure that's really appreciated in the, at the national level by a lot of the press as to how locally driven this process is. Well, you know what? That makes me think or remember that, you know, the, the great example, another great example of that, it was the, the 2000 election in Florida, right? With the, the, the butterfly ballot and the chads at, uh, were so famous or infamous, depending on on how you how you look at it, in in Palm Beach County and Volusia County, and uh, right, that was really what Mark's point about the rubber hitting the road at um, at that county level. And in Michigan, right, it's even it even falls to a lower level in terms of um, cities and and townships at, at sometimes. So it's it's it really I think it depends on on where you live. Yeah, you know, in response to the two thousand election. Uh, Congress passed the Help America Vote Act, which you know, seems strange to say it now, was totally bipartisan. Now, there was a lot of fighting about the details and everything, but it was an act that passed the Senate, I think, like 92 to 2, to make changes in response to some of the shortcomings that became evident in the following the 2000 election. Uh, and so that increased to a small degree federal oversight and state oversight of these local activities. But don't fool yourself, the folks who are putting, setting up the polling places and printing the ballots and running the machines and counting the machines are, are local folks. Excellent insight. And um, John, I want to invite you in. And um, one thing that makes me think of is that the fact that we're having this panel shows that people are starting to pay a bit of attention to Secretary of State, uh, may not as much as Congress or um, the race for president. But then that also makes me wonder, do you think we could see um, a po even more politicization of like races for county recorder of deeds or something like that? So far, the only thing I've seen Regarding that is um, the case of the woman in Colorado, Tina Peters, who um, allegedly apparently leaked information to a far right group. But it just makes me feel like first it was people paying attention to congressional and Senate special elections during the Trump administration. Now all statewide races, so maybe kind of county level stuff is next. 
Yeah, that, that's a great question. It kind of combining the, the thoughts that we've heard so far with that question. Um, one thing I think underappreciated by the academics and scholars who study these issues or national elections experts, certainly election law lawyers, um, is that for the most part, voters don't care about any of these things. Um, that when you're talking about the Secretary of State, if you go in to renew your license and your registration and it takes you more than 15 minutes, then the Secretary of State's going to have problems on the next ballot. And if it's less than that, they're probably going to be reelected. Um, not realizing, perhaps, as a, a typical voter, that they do have substantial power. Um, and I, I think it's going to be the same for county clerks. You know, here in Michigan, if you go in and, and you go to register title for a new deed that you have and it takes you an hour, um, then that's probably going to be dispositive in the way you think about the next election of that county clerk. Um, and it's unlikely people are going to be thinking a whole lot about what happened in the last election cycle. You know, now, that said, the Secretary of State does have tremendous power. And we did see a politicization of that race here in Michigan in the last cycle with our, our current Secretary of State, who has pushed a very aggressive uh, Democrat agenda with respect to the way that she has overseen elections. And you know, it's true that while the local people are are doing all the the fine points of implementing, that the Secretary of State has substantial latitude to decide what the governing rules are what types of machines that you're going to use, how late the polls are going to be open, how ballots are going to be counted and, and things of that nature. Um, and so when people are thinking about how long they were standing in line to get their license renewed this year in Michigan, they should also be thinking about the fact that Michigan Secretary of State, like others, uh, accepted millions of dollars from Facebook and other entities to send out unsolicited um absentee voter ballots, but only to those areas of Michigan that were heavily concentrated with Democrat voters and, and urban centers. Um, you know, and you can debate whether that makes sense as a policy matter to try to encourage greater voting in those areas. Um, it, there's no question that when you use monies, especially that much money in a one-sided fashion like that, at the end of the day, it's going to have the, the outcome of pushing certain percentages of the population to vote more. Um, so I, I think all the, the experts and the pundits um, underestimate how much wait times matter to voters, and voters underestimate how, how important secretaries of state and even local county officials can be to pushing processes that can affect outcomes. Hey, you know, Todd, I think jo uh, John makes two really good points, and, and, and one, I think, uh, how I think about it, uh, to this point, at least in Michigan, as long as I've been watching, right, the secretary of state election has been about competency. And, and it's just, and it is, it's been about, you know, how efficient does the, the branch office work uh, when I wanna get my uh, driver's license or my, my renew my um, uh, license plate? Or, or how have they improved things uh, for uh, online activity, right? And, and that's gonna be different this time because of uh, the, presumptive nominee, and I say presumptive nominee because at the end of April, Michigan had a uh, an endorsement convention. Uh, the, the state party, the state Republican party had an endorsement convention. There'll be another convention uh, down the road where they will officially nominate, uh, but for all intents and purposes, uh, Ms. Caramo is gonna be the nominee for Secretary of State. And, um, and she's gonna make more out of uh, the 2020 election uh, sort of a political issue here in Michigan than any, I think, any other Secretary of State candidate has in the past, right? And um, so I, I think too, and, and John is is on the money again with uh, the comments about the, the 2020 cycle and how Secretary of State Benson, you know, I think really injected herself into the political nature of this. And, and frankly, you know, that was something that helped ratchet up the politicization of a race like this uh, in Michigan, right? If, if she had not decided to send out all those absentee ballot applications, uh, I think Republicans would not have been as uh, irritated as they were uh, and have been for the last couple of years. Yeah, most traditionally these races have been fairly invisible statewide. Uh, it used to be that nine times out of 10, you know, the governor, if the governor gets elected as a Democrat, that means the rest of the statewide ticket is going to be Democrat. There's some exceptions to that in the past, but generally that's it. Now these are much more visible races. And it's the same way at the, at the local level, 
if you have an elected county clerk or whatever, those tend to be pretty low profile races, unless of course you stub your toe. I mean, in the elections, I mean, the, we used to joke, I do used to do a lot of re, re, uh, recount and contest uh, litigation. And uh, we used to always joke about when you do a recount that the local county clerk is betting her job on it coming out the same way. And it, and it doesn't much matter to her or him whether it's a Democrat or Republican that wins, she just wants the way she ran the system to to work out again. And so that there are things that make you high profile, such as the last election and the Secretary of State in Michigan and other places where they've gotten more actively involved. But most of the time in the past, they've been low profile races that frankly, nobody paid much attention to at the national level and very, very co- closely followed the top of the ticket. Yeah, and I'd be curious to know what, what Mark and David think about this nationally, but um, it almost seems like there's a potential for Secretary of State races nationwide to follow the trajectory of Attorneys General races. Um, Attorneys General, for, for years, were kind of that same under the radar. If the governor of one party won, then the Attorney General would win too. And then all of a sudden, over the last 15 to 20 years, you saw a politicization of Attorneys General positions. And those became much more important, much more focused on. And you started to see more splits between the governor and the attorney general, depending on positions that they took. And you could easily see the secretaries of state follow that same trajectory if elections continue to be contested. I think you're exactly right. Yeah, I, I do, too. I think and, and there's actually, I think, some incentive for secretaries of state uh, races across the candidates in them to actually try and uh, make make their race a national one, right? Because uh, if they start to uh, politicize that office, well, what comes with that? One, I think attention from national news will uh, will go up and two, fundraising dollars. Yep, that's you're exactly right. Polarizing the office makes it easier. Let, let's be realistic. There are any number of people sitting in the Secretary of State's office or in the AG's office who actually think they ought to be sitting in the governor's office. <laughs> so the, the way to do that is, of course, suddenly make yourself a figure that that attracts more attention. Yeah, there was always a joke about NAG, the National Association of Attorneys General, that that stood for National Association of Aspiring Governors. <laughs> and, um, you know, even just looking at our state here in Michigan, um, we had a, a former secretary of state um, who kind of put her toe in the water for a gubernatorial nomination, ended up running as a lieutenant governor candidate on someone's ticket. Uh, and the secretary of state before her ended up being elected to Congress uh, in the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, so if, if you can get the kind of national publicity and dollars that, that David was just talking about, it can be a stepping stone, a parlay into a, a different office. Yeah, excellent points. And it's really all segues into our next question. And um, I'll kick it over to Mark for this, that the 2022 elections are going to impact the Secretary of State and many Secretaries of State, I should say, um, in many ways. Um, there's a lot that are just up for election. There's some that are appointed by the governor or um, state legislature or even um, similarly where secretaries of state aren't the people run elections. Those offices will similarly likely be appointed by the state legislature governor. And it seems likely Republicans are going to do pretty well. You know, we still got about six months to go. But the flip side, in some swing states, Pennsylvania and Michigan come to mind, I think a lot of people would say Republicans made some mistakes in terms of who they're, who's likely to be the nominee or who is the nominee for governor or um, other statewide races. So, do you, um, But regardless of what the outcome is, do you all feel that the, um, and start with you, Mark, that um, the 2020 20- um, 2022 elections are going to impact the 2024 elections? Well, the answer is yes to that. How is and how much? I don't have an answer to. I, I can look around and see if I can find on the floor a crystal ball. But I can assure you that my predictions in the past haven't been very good, so don't count on my crystal ball. I mean, the, the if history is prologue, prologue and it 
you know, we, the Republicans should pick up a substantial number of seats around the country. But I also remember midterms election under Carter, I mean, under uh, Clinton, and that didn't happen. So, it, you know, it depends on what, tell me what the inflation rate is in September. Uh, tell me how the gun debate plays out. You know, tell me about how the abortion decision is assumingly coming out, how those impact. And, and, and I certainly am not smart enough to know. But whatever happens in this election will spill over uh, two years from now. And uh, some people will be more attractive candidates because of this last election than they are right at the moment. So, Todd, I think that that's and Mark's again on the money, right? With the there, there's six months to go is is multiple lifetimes in politics, right? We, there's it's just it's forever in a day, and but I think there's a case to be made that you know the, the environment right now for Democrats is arguably the the worst one we've seen in modern times for the president's party with uh, presidential approval uh, way down. Uh, lower, I think, than any president at this point in in their term, um, including Trump, including Carter, um, it, it, inflation, gas price, the whole, everybody knows these things, right? But Republicans still need to take advantage of it, and they still need to win elections. And of course, that's why we um, play the game, right? That's why we, that's why we have votes. And I think you make a point about, you know, the, some of the folks that have been nominated across the country, that it's going to make that more difficult, I think, for Republicans to take advantage of this, uh, uh, of this political environment that heavily favors them. Yeah, and I'll defer to, to Mark and David as to the, the political environment and what's likely to happen. I, I think the, the broader question of will this election have an impact on the 2024 election, I, I think that's undoubtedly true. All you have to do is just look at the platforms of the, the more politicized Democrat and Republican candidates in various secretaries of state races. Um, the Democrat secretary of states are trying to, um, what, what they would call, improve voter access to be able to, to vote by extended times, by extended um, opportunities for absentee balancing, balloting, um, you know, by allowing you know, so-called ballot harvesting, you know, things like that, things that allow more people to vote where the Republican platforms are focused more on voting security. We don't want people who haven't actually cast that ballot in a ballot harvesting situation to be able to have their vote counted and do that at the detriment of people who actually voted. Um, to, to stop the spread of sending out absentee ballots um, that were unrequested, as we saw here in Michigan during the last election cycle. You know, so whether your, your, your goal is um, to spread the opportunity to vote at all costs or election security, let's make sure that every vote that is cast is valid, uh, will obviously have a difference in the 2024 election, uh, particularly given the margins that we've seen in the several recent national elections. And when you're talking about a couple thousand to 10,000 votes in two or three swing states that make a difference in who gets elected president, then those types of things on the margins make huge differences. I don't think it'd be possible for any of us to predict today what those influences might be, uh, but but certainly there will be an impact. And, uh, you know, Todd, I think that that can take us back to that first question that you asked or a piece of it, right? Because the, the secretaries of state and, and their power differ across the country. And, and here in Michigan, right, we're seeing um, a, a battle on a couple of different fronts in terms of uh, who has the power in terms of election uh, administration. And we're seeing it play out both in the state legislature with uh, bills that are, are going through the, the legislative and political process uh, passed by a Republican-controlled legislature that end up getting vetoed by a Democratic governor. Uh, you know, so there is not much change. There has not been much change in the last two years since 2020 to how Michigan uh, does its, con 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 conducts its elections. And which is also why we're seeing ballot initiatives now pop up uh, from both sides that are going to try to do it just as John said, right on the on the left, they're going to try to uh, take their case to the people. And on the right, they're they're going to do the same thing. You know, what really impacted the process, obviously, in the last cycle was was the pandemic. 
And so the pandemic resulted in many states loosening up their process substantially, especially mail voting, which probably was realistically unavoidable given the difficulty in, in getting poll workers. The question really is, is the continuation of that. And that's where we get the huge partisan divide uh, between Republicans and Democrats. You know, suddenly you, the pandemic becomes a status quo on how to operate elections when it was really, in my viewpoint, simply a blip that had to be dealt with because of this, the illness. But many of it does mail voting, just to be straightforward, as the Carter Baker Commission points out, has serious potential problems for both security and, and simply misadventures. I mean, what percentage of the mail doesn't get delivered. Last time I checked, it was about 3%. That's an extraordinary number of votes that would be cast by people that don't, you know, realize their vote didn't get counted. So those are big numbers in this process when we're talking about thousands instead of tens of thousands of votes separating candidates. So the mail is attractive to probably everybody in this phone. Oh, well, <laughs> that saves us, you know, 20 minutes or half hour to go to vote. Uh, but it is at, at the cost of some serious security questions, leaving aside the fact that your mail that comes in is probably like my mail. There's a big stack of it on a desk somewhere. <laughs> I'm wondering, well, is this really something that I need to deal with or is this another solicitation? So, you know, it's it's fraud's a real concern, but really the, that's it's minor in comparison to the misadventures of mail uh, that to me, at least, is the biggest concern I have. And people thought, well, geez, we did it in CODA, CODA, you know, pandemic situation. And that made sense. But now the question is, do we want to return to our more traditional way of doing it? And I would suggest generally that's a better process. Excellent point. And John, that makes me think of the fact that we part of the litigation um, in regard to COVID seemed to stem from these divided governments um, like Pennsylvania, where the executive was Democrat, um, state legislature was Republican. And um, also, well, again, of course, is in part COVID, um, Democrats in particular seem to have um, really be into mail and voting and um, Republicans outside the kind of traditional absentee seem to have more of a aversion to it. So do you think we could see a lot of litigation um, spurred, um, spurred if we have like Dubai government in Pennsylvania or Michigan or other states? I think divided government in the context of a close election is a recipe for litigation. Um, I, I don't know that it'll be over the same issues as the last cycle, you know, where it was not only issues about mail-in voting and things like that, but even ballot access itself. Um, in Michigan, we had litigation in the state and federal courts over the number of signatures that were required to get a candidate on the ballot, because how can you collect 10,000 signatures if you can't go door-to-door -door and see anyone because the state's under a lockdown? Um, you know, that, that resulted in all kinds of litigation. So we, we won't see that sort of litigation, most likely, unless the, the pandemic really rears its head again in, in this cycle. Um, but I'm sure the lawyers will find uh, all kinds of new and creative ways uh, that they can try to exploit those partisan differences if elections are close. Certainly. On to David, you know, well, we've talked a lot about um, not a lot of people knowing the power of secretaries of state or probably a lot and their state don't even necessarily know who it is off the top of their hand, uh, off the top of their head. I mean, if I could think of a few secretaries of state who, at least in terms of the context of people knowing secretaries of state, were more well known, probably I'd say Catherine Harris in 2000. Um, Ken Blackwell in 2004, and especially after last week, um, Brad Raffensperger in um, 2020 in the aftermath. So it seems like um, a lot of people know more of the close state secretaries of state. Do you think they're the ones that matter more than others? And um, if not, are there may certain secretaries of state or um, and places like California or New York or um, maybe some hard red states that um, people sh um, should pay more attention to? Or maybe the answer is just like 
that inevitably in some way they matter in every state in the context of election and it's something people need to pay more attention to in general. You know, I think, Todd, the, the answer to that is it depends. And I think it, it depends on uh, the, the closeness of a race that is uh, under scrutiny, maybe. Um, and, and I, because I think in, in California or uh, Oklahoma, right, if we're talking a statewide race that is uh, not close, um, then no, I don't, I don't think that it, there's going to be much focus, right? I mean, you're, and your point about those three that you mentioned uh, really was driven home by the, the razor thin margin of, of some of those races. And, and I also think it's important to note that the, you know, those three, I don't think went looking for attention, right? It was sort of thrust upon them by the, by the situation. Now that might be changing as we've talked about, right? With the increased politicization of this, secretaries of state and sec candidates for that office might be going and looking for attention where if in the past, if it, if they got some, it, you know, it was sort of thrust upon them. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. As I said, originally, and for many years, these these were name ID races and often depended upon the top of the ticket. Now they're likely to be more independent uh, candidacies. So the party system's broken down to some degree. So yeah, there, you well may find, in fact, we are finding some candidates who want to polarize the process and they view that as useful to them. Uh, and so, you know, where this is headed, I, I don't know. Normally, when you're the secretary of state or the clerk of the courts, no news is good news when it comes to elections. You know, yeah, oh, yeah. the results are in the paper Wednesday morning and, and nobody's bitching about them. You're great. Now, to be candid with you, most of that is driven by how close the races are. If, the, if all the races aren't close, then you ran a good election because nobody's paying any friggin' attention to it. So no matter what happened, they, it went okay. Uh, but if somebody wins or loses by 10 votes, uh, welcome to the microscope. And the inevitable problems that you have in these systems, because they involve thousands of people and millions of pieces of paper, you're going to be some hiccups. I mean, the system's not run by, by perfect people because there aren't any perfect people. So, you know, this is most of the attentions that Secretary of State's get are, are driven by happen chance. Uh, the Secretary of State of Georgia, prior to the last presidential election, there's nobody on this call, and probably nobody watching this call, who knew who he was. I actually might have known who he was because I've done some litigation down there, but nobody knows who these people are. I hate to tell them that, but that's the reality, except if they have stubbed their toe or something, and that's now changing, apparently. And, and we'll probably see that play out here in Pennsylvania as this recount uh, goes on and, and, you know, we'll see how those vote totals change. And, and maybe, you know, that's another example of, of a secretary of state that will be, uh, well, you know, we'll, we'll have a spotlight on, on him. Yeah. I, I second everything that, that David and Mark just said um, that, that pretty much national notoriety is driven by close races that people are paying attention to. And not, not the local township race that we had a few cycles ago that was decided by one vote because no one cared. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there is one other way that, that a secretary of state can get into the news. They, they do have the ability to keep some people off the ballot. Um, you know, so even in a state like California or New York, if someone is excluded from the ballot because they think that there were inadequate signatures that were submitted or there was fraud in signatures that were submitted, which is a, an issue in Michigan right now, um, or, or even some states may have restrictions based on, you know, criminal backgrounds and things like that, that you could interpret more strictly or more liberally, um, ballot access is, is still a big deal. Um, it, it may never get to the level of a, a Catherine Harris where the presidential election turns on a, a recount, um, but, but certainly that's one way to get your name in the news and not necessarily in, in a way that you would want. Yeah, excellent point. And Mark, to follow up on uh, one thing you raised, um, in terms of it being unpredictable, who's going to be in the national spotlight, are, um, and maybe this is easier said than done, are there things secretaries of state should be doing just to prepare for that, um, that so they aren't necessarily blindsided by the media. I'm not necessarily accusing anyone of 
but it, you know, it's conceivable it could happen to someone. Sure. I mean, and I think that realistically, the, the wise or uh, secretaries of states, the ones who are paying attention in the states that are likely to be close in either a Senate race or a presidential race, which is the, the things that get national attention, let's be candid. Uh, other recounts uh, are unlikely to get as, as much attention. So sure, they should be thinking about how to deal with this. The, the, you know, the timing questions are real important, uh, how quickly you can get results out and how accurate they are. Uh, the sooner you can get the results out, the better it is for credibility. People, you know, the conspiracies ramp up uh, to fill the void of information. So if you're a secretary of state, ways you can improve the timeliness of your vote counting process helps a lot. I mean, accuracy is more important than timeliness, but don't fool yourself. Timeliness is very important to credibility. And, and you know, Todd, we're seeing that in Michigan, and we have seen that in Michigan. The, the, um, the, the clerks around the state have asked for uh, the ability to process absentee ballots uh, before uh, election day. Um, there have been other uh, reform proposals put out there that in the past had bipartisan support, but now all of a sudden they have gotten uh, to be partisan. And, you know, people who supported them in the past don't support them anymore. Um, it gets back to that conversation we had about politicization and polarization, right? And, and, and that's another way I think you see it is that uh, you know, people are are maneuvering in in ways that they hadn't before, and and are maybe taking positions that they hadn't taken before, uh, b because they're the, the because of the the base, uh, the political party base is is responsive in a way that they to to an issue like this that they hadn't been before. So I you know I think it 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 really is all changing. Yeah, on that very issue, you, you could see that with our current Secretary of State in the context of redistricting. Uh, back when she was uh, at a law school and doing academic work, um, she wrote a, a very persuasive law review article about districts where there was a minority population that had a majority of the district and how if you wanted to comply with the Voting Rights Act, that you couldn't reduce that minority population as a percentage of the district below a certain number. And I forget what that was. It may have been 55 percent. But then all of a sudden, when a redistricting commission comes in, and reduces almost all of those districts in Michigan below the threshold in a way that benefited Democrat candidates because it spread out more Democrat voters among more districts, all of a sudden she's fully in support of it. Um, so no, nothing changed over that time. Certainly the social science behind her reasoning in her law review article didn't change, but based solely on the politics, she made a change. Now, as far as the, the question, you know, what should secretaries of state be doing um, they're, they're not taking my advice, but if, if they were, I would give them three pieces. You know, one, um, training, training, training. Make sure that all of your local election officials understand the rules and everybody is applying them the same way so you don't end up with situations where one county looks like it's doing it differently than another county. That's an indispensable way to keep attention off of your office. Um, number two is to have a really good communications director, because when it's time to get in front of the microphone and the television camera, a little media training never hurts. Um, the third, and, and this might be the most important, is to populate your office with the, the civil servant staff, the non-elected people who are really bipartisan or at a minimum represent the views of both parties. Um, it, it's a lot tougher to make accusations that a secretary of state is putting her or his thumb on the scale when everybody in the operation is working together in a bipartisan manner. When, when you've got nothing but one party represented in an office, then those accusations get very easy to make and, and they're very difficult to disabuse. Um, so I, I would love to see more diversity of politics in state election offices. Oh, I, I couldn't agree more vocally the the no I'm not much of a fan of nonpartisan because I just everybody has a world view, but I am wildly in favor of bipartisan. And and what happens is that that if you have offices that have people from both parties there, they have an interest, a self interest, which is always a good thing, a self interest in the elections running well. And so you want a situation where you have. Some of the states, it's a common, I use Ohio as an example, 
The Board of Elections at the county levels in Ohio have a Democratic and Republican county chairman as co-chairman of, of the Board of Elections, which is not a bad design. That's a good starting point. You've got two people from opposite sides who have an interest in the system running well. Uh, and they're more interested in the system running well than they are, frankly, in their candidate winning at the back end because, you know, they, they've got, I'm involved, I'm in charge of this, so I want it to have been, you know, they're still partisans, but they, they're also strongly in favor of the institutional function. In Michigan, right, we, we've seen the, and talk about a, a, a body that, that exists that nobody ever knew who was part of it, right? The the board of canvassers, the state board of canvassers would be that in Michigan for sure. But now a lot more people know who's on the state board of canvassers uh, for, for any number of reasons, right? Back to the certification question in 2020, and, and John was mentioning some um, uh, signature questions that are, that are, uh, are just played out last week here in Michigan about gubernatorial candidates. Well, uh, you know, and there are, you know, th that is a structure of two Democrats and two Republicans. Um, but that hasn't stopped uh, polarization or politicization from being injected into even that kind of, you know, to this point, a very uh, anonymous <laughs> uh, entity, uh, which is no longer anonymous, right? It's gotten a, a great deal of coverage in the last couple of years. Again, you know, when you the the system just across the board in every way, shape, or form is is more polarized. Again, as I say, after the real close, I mean, the last presidential election was sort of close, but let's be candid, it wasn't really close. What was really close was Bush v. Gore. That was really close. And following Bush v. Gore, we passed a major piece of election law for across the country on a bipartisan, not that there wasn't a lot of sharp elbow, I was involved in the drafting process, not that there wasn't a lot of fighting, a lot of shell arbos, but at the end, we came out with a piece of legislation which wasn't perfect, but it was an improvement in the system. Uh, but now I don't know that that's possible. In fact, there wasn't any serious discussion. In the US Congress in this cycle, it was incredibly disappointing to me to see HR 1 being a purely partisan bill with no Republican input on it. I mean, I can't imagine a worse thing to do right now for the confidence in the system is to pass a piece of legislation on part, purely partisan lines on elections. That's a huge, huge mistake. That was an incredibly dumb thing for the Democrats to do in, in Congress. They, I actually believe it, it's, maybe I'm crazy, that there was some chance that they could have come up with a bill that would have gotten some bipartisan support like the Hava bill. I mean, there was a lot of hot temper following the Bush v. Gore election, but it didn't stand in the way of people sitting down and saying, what really didn't work in this election and what could we do better? Hey, Mark, was, was the scope of the Help America Vote Act smaller than H.R. 1? Yes. That was introduced? Yes, it was significantly smaller. It was more focused. It had more of a traditional Federalist bent in the sense that it was, you know, money going out to the states for the states to decide how to change their election system. There were some provisions on a, on a broader basis, you know, regarding voter lists and provisional balloting, all of which I think were basically good provisions. It was a consensus, absolutely a consensus bill uh, that still left the vast majority of running elections at the state and local level. The, the proposal, H.R. 1, was simply not that. It was just simply to federalize our election system, which, yeah, you know, I'm, I can't imagine anything I'm more opposed to than that. John, this touches on um, a lot of what's been discussed already, particularly in the beginning, but part of why this um, panel came together is that we're seeing so many more issues or braces um, for office be politicized. Um, we saw it even before Trump uh, with the sec uh, with the Supreme Court state Supreme Court races and the impact that's having now and you know in certain places you can say that see that with mayoral and even state legislature races. So it seems like, to a certain degree at least, these secretaries of state races are going to be 
um, polit- nationalized as I think a good example of that to a certain degree, at least in terms of attempts, but um, was Georgia and the Secretary of State primary, um, but arguably, I guess the national Trump's nationalization of me failed. Um, but at the end of the day, there are these are still state offices with an array of duties. So as these races get more nationalized, are there potentially um, certain local constituencies that have risk being overlooked? Well, I, I think that's certainly true. You know, that goes back to what we were saying at the outset that for the vast swath of voters, what they care about is how long they stand in line at the Secretary of State office branch that's nearest to them. Um, and, and so what they care about is efficiency and competency and being able to quickly deal with the problems that they have interacting with the state government. And so to the extent that these are being turned into partisan races, that's really to the disadvantage of those voters. Um, you know, The next secretary of state who comes in may be far more focused on making changes to the next election process than processing a driver's license renewal. Um, and, and so I think that is detrimental. You know, and, and so then that might cause one to ask, well, why is it that we're in this environment where what used to be the most innocuous of races are now becoming heavily partisan races? And I think we can probably point to two things. Um, you know, one, certainly term limits in Michigan has made a difference. You know, when you look at our legislature, it used to be that representatives and senators would serve together a very long time. And knowing that they had to get along with the other side in the same way that U.S. Supreme Court justices serving for life learn how to to get along really well, even on opposite sides of the political spectrum, like Justices Scalia and Ginsburg, because time forces them to have a relationship that that term limits takes away. Uh, But I think even the the bigger one is just the the impact of social media on the way that individual citizens collect their news. Uh, You know, Real Clear Politics is one of those very, very few sites anymore where you can get balanced reporting that includes views from both sides. Um, pretty much everybody else is playing to their base and then people are going there accordingly. So it's entirely possible that a a Republican voter has never heard anything from the Democrat perspective on any issue that they care about and and vice versa for the Democrat voter. And so all of a sudden, every single one of these races becomes more partisan. You know, so take the Michigan Secretary of State office as an example. Um, You know, when I was growing up in Michigan, um, you know, 40 to 50 years ago, that was pre-term limits. We had the same secretary of state for decades. And as long as they were doing a good job, you know, no one cared. There there was no partisanship that was injected into that. Today, where a secretary of state can only serve for two terms and every voter is being fed information about the previous election and the things that she did and did not do from only one side of the spectrum, you know, that's a recipe for a highly partisan race where uh, people aren't coming together anymore. So I think social media and, and term limits, at least in our state, have had a very detrimental impact on bipartisanship and have exacerbated partisan trends that we're seeing in other states and nationally as well. Thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate you providing your expertise and your time. This was a very productive and insightful conversation.